So the Brachistochrome problem was this problem that came up around the time of Newton and the Bernoulli brothers. And it was this problem of if you take an object and you let it fall, so over here, if you have an object that's falling, say it's a little circle or a sphere that's falling down some path from point A to point B, what is the fastest path that will get you from A to B? Now, it turns out the solution to this problem is called the Brachistochrone curve. So there are some good ways of getting the Brachistochrone curve. One of them is using calculus of variations. One of the results of using that method is you essentially get the equations of what's called a cycloid. Now, it turns out the Brachistochrone curve is actually part of a cycloid. Now a cycloid is if you were to take a little circle and you were to poke a little hole at the edge and you roll it along some edge and you draw out that point. Now I did another video about the Brachistochrone curve where I explained it, so I'll show that right here. So this is the Brachistochrone curve. So this is the fastest path. So if this, let's say it rolls down this way, A, B, this is the fastest path that you can take to get there the fastest, to get from point A to point B the fastest. So it turns out the Brachistochrome curve comes out of something just very simple, just out of rolling a circle. And if you draw it out just right, you can get that path of least time called the Brachistochrome. It's actually very simple, very simple way of getting it. If you've looked up videos online of how to drive the Brachistochrome, you've probably seen, at least I've definitely seen videos of people using calculus variations to derive the cycloid. Now that is a perfectly good way of doing it, but there's actually a much simpler way of doing it that takes a lot less time. And that is if you just use Snell's law. So what Snell's law tells you is if you have some mediums, so a medium is any material like glass, water, or whatever, something that light can travel through. And each medium has an index of refraction, which is just the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the velocity of light in that medium. So what Snell's law allows you to do is if you have light traveling through mediums and it's in like this medium here, which could be whatever you want it to be, air, glass or whatever, and it travels into another medium here and that has some angle with respect to the normal, which is just perpendicular to these parallel lines here, the normal line. So if you have light in one medium with an angle with respect to the normal, and then it moves on to another medium, Snell's Law tells you exactly what that new angle will be. Okay, so to start off, let's take a look at Snell's Law again here. So we have, so let's say as our step number one, let's look at Snell's Law. So remember that N, the index of refraction, is just C over V, speed of light in vacuum, divided by the speed of light in the medium. You can cancel out all those Cs uh, very easily, just cancel them out. Now what Snell's Law tells you, it's actually really cool, tells you that this proportion sine theta over V in every single medium is the same. They are all equal. So if you have light going through a bunch of different mediums in one go, you can calculate these proportions uh, as long as you have the either V or theta or whatever the situation uh, grants you. So this is really useful actually, the fact that this proportion is equal at every single medium. That's really important. Because what this says, oh, and I didn't mention, so this bit, so this guy, that is just the final medium. This is the proportion at the final medium, wherever it, you decide it's going to stop, it stops here, uh, where theta n is the final angle, and vn is the final speed of light in that medium. So here I have sine theta i over vi is equal to sine theta n over vn, that's the final medium. Now theta i over vi, this bit is any of the previous uh, proportions before the final one. So it could be sine theta one over V1, sine theta two over V2, et cetera. You just plug in whatever number you want into I. So that represents any of the mediums and that represents the final one. Now we can simplify the final one. So to go back to the board here, what's important to note is with Snell's law and light, if you have this angle, theta, the total angles that light can make here is zero, all the way up to pi over two. So this would be pi over two if the light were just going straight this way. Those are the only possible angles that light can make uh, in this situation. So what this means is that if you have enough mediums that the light is going through, eventually 
it's going to approach pi over 2. So we can actually simplify this by saying that at n, the final medium, sine theta n approaches sine of pi over 2. So we can simplify that to be sine pi over 2 over vn, which equals 1 over vn, which simplifies this quite a bit. So if I rewrite this, and now we have this new equation, well, just a rearranged equation, which says that the sine of the angle is equal to vi over vn, which is a very simple equation which tells you every angle that the light makes in whichever medium that it goes through, in whichever medium you're interested in. So now we have this equation, and it's very useful in this form because in my other video, I just plugged it into some code, and I showed that it yielded the same results as the cycloid, and you can go watch that if you want. But I'm going to go further with this. The thing about the brachistochrome curve is it's concerning a falling object. As of yet, we have not included any sort of falling aspect to uh, Snell's law or anything like that. It's just light traveling through mediums. And so we're missing something. We need to include, as I like to say, some sort of falling aspect. What that will entail is we're just going to map the velocities of the light to the velocities of the falling object. And the falling object velocities can be found very easily. So if you have a ball or something that's rolling down some path and no friction, because uh, you can do it with friction, but it gets a little bit more complicated, and I'm not going to do that in this video. And just assume since there's no friction, it's not going to roll, so there's no rolling kinetic energy. So here you have conservation of energy. Now we can simplify this a bit. Let's say it starts at rest, so that goes to zero. And then we can cancel out some m's as well, and we can solve this. Uh, that was already canceled. Uh, we can solve this for vf here. Now after a little bit of work, you can see that vf is equal to the square root of 2 times g, the gravitational constant, times this quantity yi minus yf. So that's the initial y position and the final y position. So we can say that yi starts at 0, so we can simplify it even further. It actually kind of comes out to this weird looking thing, which I personally don't like looking at. Uh, so we can actually just change that and just say that it's equal to 2g yf square root where yf is uh, greater than 0. That's the same thing. Otherwise, yf would be less than 0, which would make it positive. So we can take this equation, vf equals square root of 2gy, and we can plug it into this equation here. So if we do that, we get sine of theta, let's just call it theta, make it simple, equals... So V, I, that's just going to be, let's call it 2G, Y, square root, divided by the final, which I'll call 2G, capital H. Well, capital H is just the fallen height that the ball takes. That's simplified down to square root of Y over H, which is real nice and simple. So we have that equation. Now, next, I want to show this real quick. So we have a more simplified scenario where you just have one medium and you have a light ray. It's traveling. I like to have a little arrow at the end. Now, if we want this to work, and as it was evident in my other video about the brachistochrone, if you want to actually get the brachistochrone out of this, you need to assume that the number of mediums that the light travels through is very, very large. Really, it should approach infinity, and the separation between the mediums has to be very, very small, approaching zero. So let's say that the amount you move in the x at one medium, or one step, is dx, just some infinitesimally small amounts, um, dy again, and then ds, which is just uh, dx squared plus dy squared square root. And then you have some angle between them, and this will be useful at the next couple steps. So here we have the equation that we just derived, sine theta equals square root of y over h. Now sine theta, if you know anything from geometry class or any of your math classes really, uh, you should know that sine theta is opposite or hypotenuse. So if this is the angle here, opposite dx over hypotenuse ds means that this is equal to dx over ds. And so we can rearrange this guy to be something a little bit different. So now I've rearranged this so that dx is on one side and ds is on the other side. And remember this, so I did this without you looking. So this is dx squared plus dy squared square root, which is just equal to ds squared. So that just comes out of Pythagorean theorem. And what we can do next is we can just square both sides. So if we square this side and square this side, it'll actually change it to be a little 
more easy to work with. Okay, so I squared both sides, and now we get this simplified dx squared equals y over h times this quantity dx squared plus dy squared. And then we can simplify this even further by distributing the y over h to the dx squared and the dy squared, the dy squared. So you see I distributed them, and we can bring over this term over here to collect the terms together. So now if we take this term and divide it over to this side and do a square root. Now here we have a differential equation. This is actually the differential equation of the cycloid, uh, which if you do it the calculus of variations way, this is what you get, except you probably won't call it h, you'll call it 2r or whatever. Uh, but that is the same exact equation as you get for the cycloid, which is really great. Now I'm going to take it even further because I want the equations for x and the equations for y, the parametric equations. So I'm going to show how to do that in the best way that I can. So I should note how I'm going to solve this differential equation as if it's a cycloid. I showed in my other video that this method of using Snell's log gets the exact same result as a cycloid. So I think I have good reason to imagine it as a cycloid, but my main purpose for doing that is because there's these knowns that I know. We know at theta equals zero and pi and two pi what y is. And I couldn't really think of a way to do that with Snell's Law, so I'm just going to do it with a cycloid. So if you were to draw out the cycloid, which I already did here, but it starts out here, theta equals zero, and then you move it over, and you just draw it out something like that. I'm not doing it exactly right, but you get the idea. Now what I want to do here is find the equation for y, so the y-coordinate of the cycloid. So the way I can do that is I need a sort of guess for what the y equation for the cycloid is going to look like. And I can cleverly make a good guess by taking a look at the cycloid here. I expect the x is probably going to have a linear term because you're literally just translating the circle to the right, which, spoiler alert, it does. But Let's pretend like we don't know that. Uh, but the y, if, if you didn't know that it was translating, it would just look like it's rotating. Because the only thing that's contributing to the y is just the rotation. Because uh, it turns out that the tallest height that you can get to is 2 times the radius, as you can clearly see there. And also, you can tell that the y is going to be oscillating because it goes up, and then it goes down, and then eventually it's going to go up again, it's going to go down again. So it's oscillating, so I'm going to need some sort of oscillatory term, which is going to be either cosine or sine. I'm going to choose a cosine, because the thing about sine is that, well, first I just say, the point where we know things, the points that we know things, are right here, which y equals 0 and theta equals 0. So theta equals 0, and it's just at the bottom. And right here, which is y equals 2r, and theta is equal to pi. So these are the points that we actually know things about. So we shouldn't use sine because that sine of zero goes to zero and sine of pi goes to zero. So you probably don't want to use sine. So I'm going to choose cosine because it doesn't disappear at those thetas, zero and pi. So let's make a guess here. Let's say that the y equation is going to be something like a cosine theta plus b. Assuming there's no linear term and a and b are just constants that we're going to find, our knowns are the following, like I just said, theta equals 0, y equals 0, theta equals 2 pi. If you were to go all the way um, past uh, where y equals 2r, you get y equals 0 as well. You actually won't need that. You just need the first one. And then theta equals pi, y equals 2r. So now we can use these equations to solve for a and b. So let's do that. So first, let's plug in theta equals 0 and y equals 0. And I just realized I completely abandoned my step numbering process, but uh, whatever, I'll forget about that. So if we plug in theta equals 0 and y equals 0, we get y equals 0, which equals a times cosine of 0 plus b. Now, cosine of 0 is not 0, it's 1. And so this tells us that negative a is equal to b. So now let's plug in theta equals pi y equals 2r. So this gets us y is equal to 2r, which is equal to a times cosine of pi plus b. And cosine of pi, that's negative 1. And this gets us 2r plus a equals b. Now what we can do, we can plug in this 
to that equation. So we get negative a equals 2r plus a, and we could solve for a, get a negative 2a when you bring it over, it's equal to 2r, so that a is equal to negative r. And if you remember, negative a equals b, so b then is equal to r. So a equals negative r, b equals r, and so we can write y to be, and so here we get the equation for the y position of the cycloid right here. And we can actually use this to get the x equation for the cycloid as well. So now we have our equation for y. I'm going to plug this into our differential equation, but first I want to get uh, dy, uh, because as you remember, there's actually a dy in that equation. And so I'm just going to differentiate both sides. So as you can see, this is what you get. When you differentiate the cosine, you get a minus sine. And so that's why the uh, minus sign goes away and that term goes to zero. Then you have a d theta left over. So dy equals r sine theta d theta. So now what I can do is I can plug in um, y and dy to our differential equation. So here's what we get. I know it looks complicated, but it will simplify in just a couple steps. So what I should note is, and I should change something. Here I have h and an r in the same equation. I should get h in terms of r. So if you remember, the tallest height you can get to is 2r. So I'm just going to say that h is equal to 2r. So I'm just going to scribble that out and put a 2r. Uh, those are the same thing. I just want them in terms of r's, which can simplify this equation. So right away, we can cancel out an r. So you can see this r just cancels out real nicely. So as you can see, we can simplify this bottom. And also, what I'm going to do in the next step is you can actually bring the sine theta into the square root. So if you say, if you change sine theta to sine squared theta, you can pull it in to the square root, and it's the same thing. So let's do that. So here you can see you get a 1 minus cosine at the top, and a 1 plus cosine at the bottom, and a sine squared theta. Now the thing about sine squared theta is that that is equal to 1 minus cosine squared theta. It's just a useful and handy trigonometric identity that we can use. So we plug that in. Well, actually, before we plug that in, you should also realize this is equal to 1 minus cosine theta times 1 plus cosine theta, which is super duper nice because we can plug that in and cancel out 1 plus cosine theta. So let's do that. So here we have this. We can cancel out a 1 plus cosine theta. Awesome. As you can see, we have two 1 minus cosine thetas, so two of these terms. So if you take the square root of that, you end up with just one term. So this simplifies to something super nice, r times 1 minus cosine theta d theta. And remember, this is equal to dx. Now, funnily enough, uh, this term is y, which I don't know what the significance of that is, but it just happens to also be y. Uh, but we're not done yet, so that's interesting, but whatever, I'll just move on. Uh, now we can differentiate both, uh, not differentiate, now we can integrate both sides to get x. Now our bounds are just, let's say we go from zero to x, start at zero, go to x, and go from zero to theta. All right, so here we are. We have our x, which is a function of theta. And as I said, I was right, there is a linear term of theta. Um, well, I did know that already because I actually saw the equations, but we were right with our logic that there is a linear term and an oscillatory term. So here are our two equations, x equals that, and y equals that, which are the exact same equations as the cycloid. And if you plotted this, uh, you will get the Bertistochrone curve, or really you will get a cycloid curve, but the part, one part of that cycloid curve is the Bertistochrone curve. This was all possible because light always takes the fastest path. And so really the way I think about it is light does most of the hard work and it finds the fastest path. And then we just have to do some nice little math to get at the equations for the cycloid. And it's actually a lot easier, at least in my mind, that I've seen um, of getting these equations for the cycloid than if you were to do a different way, like calculus variations. But there are different ways, but they're all valid in their own ways. All right, so that's basically all I have. Thank you for watching. But that's basically all I have for this video. And if you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like if you want. And you can subscribe, obviously. If you want to see more videos like this, uh, at this point, I've started to make videos pretty regularly. So I think you can probably expect that uh, from here on out. So if you like videos like this or any other videos on my channel, uh, you can subscribe to see more.
Okay, thank you for watching, and that's all I got.